morning, church. Please be seated. Thank you all for being here this Sunday. Uh, most of you should have received an email this week from our pastoral staff. So that's definitely if you're a member and if you've given us your email, but also if you're an attender who's given your email at some point and you've signed on to some ministries, you should have received an email from our pastoral staff giving you the latest updates on how we're preparing for possible responses and cancellations due to the COVID-19 fears. Uh, we will try to update that, that email weekly or biweekly as needed. Okay? Uh, it's also posted on our website, but look out for that email first. Just to clarify so that you know, we plan to continue worship services. Uh, if we ever have to come to the point of cancellation, worship services would be the last thing. Okay, but we want to continue worship services, um, and uh, we, we expect attendance to continue to drop, which would drop our numbers uh, to a point where we would not be considered a, a gathering that is too large according to uh, government standards. standards. So as you can see, there's plenty of parking, there's plenty of room. Uh, we, we've taken preventative measures, but we want the word of God to continue. I wanna answer another question that some have asked us, are we planning to live stream our services? Uh, the AV team can correct me if this is mistaken, but what I've been told is that we do not, in our present setup, have the technological equipment or capability to officially live stream any service through our camera. Uh, I am told that in our new building, that will be a possibility. So right now, the answer is no, not officially, but anybody with Facebook Live uh, can go Facebook Live or Instagram Live, and that would be uh, the best that we could offer. Um, we will definitely send you an email and notify you if, in the event, that the local school districts council, that we understand that that would naturally create greater fear and many of our church members may uh, elect not to attend. Uh, at that point, I think the pastors will prayerfully decide on whether or not we will gather, but my recommendation will be, if that's the case, once again, attendance will be low enough that we should gather so that the word of God can continue to be preached, okay? So please, um, please continue to check your email, uh, check your spam box if you did not receive that email this week, and you can also look to our website for a simple uh, update. Well, today's passage is a very familiar one. It's a section from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where Jesus commands his followers, don't be anxious about your life and don't worry about tomorrow. And the topic of anxiety and worry makes for such a timely message. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19, has created a growing spirit of fear and panic. And today we're going to see that while we ought to be responsible and concerned, we must live remembering that we have an active and personal God. God is not just existent and transcendent in heaven. He is on his throne, but he also is actively, personally involved in the lives of every single believer. And so we must continue to pray for the sick. We must continue to love our neighbor. We must continue to take reasonable amounts of prevention. But what we want to practice is wise precaution, not worried panic. We cannot forget that behind the heart of this passage and all of scripture is a creator who sustains every breath of life. God ordains life. God created us knowing how long we will live and how we will pass away and when we will pass away. So even if we take preventative measures, we are actually not in control of when we will breathe our last. And beyond that, I believe that even though we take responsible measures, that God ordains every trial. So even the trials that come upon us are part of, part of God's sovereign plan, disease or not. And therefore, we must remember that God is our sustainer. And we will respond to crisis but we will not respond to crisis as if we were Christ-less. 
And so I've entitled our message today, Anxious Souls, Sovereign Savior. Anxious Souls, Sovereign Savior. Anxiety is natural. Fear is part of life. But the difference with a child of God is that we have a sovereign Savior who sits on his throne. So if you have God's word, let's turn to the enduring word now. Take God's word and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we are going to be looking at verses 25 to 34. It's a long passage, so we won't read it all at once. We'll read it as we go along. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And what we're going to see in this passage are four reasons that Christ followers must not be governed by anxiety. Four reasons why, in other words, we must not worry about aspects of our life that are beyond our control. When we worry, what happens is that we forget about our purpose, our provider, our priority, and our perspective. I'll give those to you as we go along. But when we worry, we forget, we forget about our purpose, our provider, our priority, and our perspective. So the first one we see in verse 25, point number one, is our divine purpose. When we are overly anxious, when we worry beyond reasonable responsibility, we're no longer concerned, but we have forgotten our purpose in life. So point number one is our divine purpose. Here's point number one for you. Our divine purpose. Let me read to you verse 25. Jesus says, therefore, connecting you with the previous passage, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body." At what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So when Jesus says rhetorically, is not life more than what you eat and what you wear, he's pointing back at what is the greater purpose of life? And as a Christian, what is our greatest purpose for God creating us? All right, so notice in verse 25 the connective, therefore I tell you, therefore connects. This passage with the previous passage where Jesus warned us not to lay up our treasures here on earth. And that would include investing so much in our health as if our lives here are everything and all that we have. There is a natural connection between anxiety and money. You see, money is how we purchase food and money is how we purchase clothing. And the more money you have, the more options you have. You can have options of what type of clothing you want and a greater variety of clothing. You have options to what you want to eat, how you want to eat it, and, how, and the quality of food that you want. Right. So the more money you have, the more options and control you have. And so, so those who are rich may not worry about the basic provision of food uh, and, and, and anxious about the basic provision of clothing, but they worry about other things in life. And there are many in this world and in Jesus' time that actually struggled with providing for their basic daily bread and their basic daily clothing for them and their families. And we're even talking about having warm clothing to survive through the winter or survive through the night. So this is a reality for people in Jesus' day and in our times. And Jesus' command for us is simple. Do not be anxious about your life. Now, this phrase, do not be anxious, and some of your translations say do not worry about your life. This is in the present imperative. Now, why would Jesus command this? Because what you worry about reveals who or what you worship. And so since we're not to worship and idolize money and possessions and what money offers you, which is more control and more options, we must trust God to provide everything that we need. Now, when you look at the situation that we're in today, in terms of COVID-19, it doesn't matter how much money you have. Nobody has discovered a vaccine. So you can't get to the front of the line to purchase it. And even in the testing, they may test you wrong, according to the news, right? They might miss the mark. So 
I love how this pandemic reveals how desperately we need God. That money cannot buy you the vaccine or the cure that does not exist. But I know one person who knows how to heal. His name is Jesus Christ. And for his sovereign reason, he's not revealed it to us. But he's gotten our attention, hasn't he? He's gotten our attention. He's brought us before, our, before him on our knees, and he's reminded us of the greater disease of sin that separates us from him, and he's reminded us of the importance of worship. You see, when we realize that there are things in life that we cannot control, we begin to worship. And therefore, the greatest cure for anxiety and worship, uh, and the greatest cure for anxiety is worship. The greatest concern for worry is worship. Praise be to God that we are reminded that there is a God that we are to worship. It's interesting that this word used for life, do not worry about your life, is the same word for soul. And Hence, our title, Anxious Souls, Anxious Life, Anxious Souls. Thus, anxiety and worry create a disease for the soul. And the Savior gives us the cure for the soul. The word anxious or worry is used six times in one single passage, this particular passage. You don't see a lot of times where the same word, uh, this word worry is used in one particular passage. But look at the concentration of the use of don't be anxious or anxiety and worry in one passage and that gets our attention that there's one thing that Jesus wants us to worry about and that's not to be worried. There's one thing that he wants us to be anxious about and that's not to be anxious, but to trust in him. One commentator explains that to be anxious describes an internal disturbance at the emotional and psychological level. It's true. Anxiety is like an emotional hurricane. It moves beyond reasonable concern. So there is, an, there is a point where we ought to be concerned. We, wa we ought to be reasonable. We ought to plan, right? The, the opposite of concern is recklessness. Now, the Bible tells us that we ought to be worried about things. We ought to be worried about God. We ought to be worried about our spiritual life. We ought to be worried about sin. We ought to be worried about our eternal destination. We ought to be worried about loving our neighbor, we ought to be worried about providing and working and not being lazy. So the Bible tells us that we ought to be responsible. But there's a level of concern that moves beyond concern where we begin to think, oh man, there are things that are out of my control. And only God can control these things. And that's where anxiety kicks in. You see, it's one thing to be worried reasonably, but once you become overly anxious, then at that point, it begins to affect your psyche and your soul, and it begins to disturb you, and you begin to act irrationally, like panic buying. And so there are times in life where we should worry, but Jesus is telling us today that if you are his child, these promises are only for believers. But if you are his child, will he not provide for you your basic needs? And beyond that, will he not provide everything you need to live the Christian life? And so I know that I'm preaching to the choir. So, so the way that I'm approaching this is more of preaching hope. But if you look at the original context, he's giving a rebuke, a gentle rebuke. He, in verse 30, says, you of little faith. I know that the people who need to hear that rebuke are probably not sitting here this morning. They've probably elected, and some of them maybe for good reasons. They're not here this morning. So I know today we're preaching to the saints. So I want, you, I want to give it to you in the tone of exhortation and encouragement that we must not be of little faith, that we must have, have great faith in a God who provides. When Jesus says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing, this is a rhetorical question, as we said earlier. Yes, life is way more than food and clothing. And then we see now in verses 26 to 30 that Jesus gives us two illustrations to make this point that he will provide. And that leads us to point number two. So what we've seen is our divine purpose. Our divine purpose is to worship God. Our divine purpose is to live for our creator. 
Our divine purpose is to live for Jesus Christ and to worship him. But now we see our divine provider. Point number two, our provider. So when we worry, we forget about our purpose and we forget about our provider. I, I misspelled that on the slide, but there should be an R at the end. Our divine provider, R for reformed. Okay, so it's two illustrations Two illustrations that Jesus has used, Jesus uses from lesser to greater. And basically what he's saying is, if, I, if I've created you, will I not provide for you? If I've saved you, will I not give you everything you need to live the Christian life? Right? And, and I want to even go bigger than this. Matthew 28, Jesus gives us all the Great Commission. You know, it would be quite a stumbling block for us to go out trying to share the gospel while being malnourished, not having enough food, and naked. You'd be a stumbling block. Walking around sharing the gospel naked? So if God's going to save you and if he's going to commission you, he's going to give you food and he's going to give you clothing. And, and if it's in his will for us to go home with him or, or to have some trial, then it's part of his purpose. Then when we get to the other side, we will understand everything that we don't understand now and why he allows certain people to go through certain trials. And I want you to see that even in Jesus' in Jesus's examples, he does not negate the need for response stability. I want you to notice in verse 26, his first illustration, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You see this argument of lesser to greater. Birds are, are good, but birds are less valuable than humans. And birds who are never saved and redeemed are less valuable than the Christian, than the redeemed who are purchased by the blood of Christ. Yet the Lord takes care of the birds. But I want you to see this illustration of the birds and their need for basic food. Birds are responsible. They work. They wake up early, sometimes too early. And you hear them, you hear them up in the morning. Birds search for food. They cannot just sit there in their nests. They need to build their nests. Yet they are not worried. They go to work each day, but they know that the food will be there somewhere. It may be a worm, it may be something else, but it's gonna be there, and they go out and get it. They generate a great, a great work for our human economy, especially our car wash industry, right? They, they are precise in their targeting, in annoying us, constantly dropping their droppings everywhere as evidence that they eat. And so birds are there. Birds live day by day. They eat what they find. And Jesus says the birds don't sow and reap, which means they don't farm. They just go out there and God provides the food. They don't store into barn houses, meaning they don't have refrigerators. They don't have to store up their food. We do. They don't, right? God just provides for them, but they're responsible. So you see the human responsibility is not negated in this. We must work hard, but there are things in life that are outside the realm of our control, that as hard as we work, we cannot prevent and we cannot control the outcome. And so that's when we need to learn to surrender our anxieties to God because he is in control. Jesus' line of argument is, aren't humans more valuable than birds? Now, the biblical teaching on God's provision calls to mind Exodus 16. I love Exodus 16 where God has delivered Israel from Egyptian slavery, yet they're worried about their daily bread. You get how that doesn't make sense. God rescues them from slavery. He led them out of Egypt and Egyptian slavery so that he can lead them in the promised land. He led them out so that he can lead them in. It just doesn't make sense for them to worry. Why would God lead you out just for you to starve? It doesn't make any sense. He led you out so that he can lead you in. When you apply this spiritually to Christianity, he led us out of spiritual slavery and sin and death so that we can starve? So that we can go naked? It just doesn't make sense. He led us out so that he can lead us into the true and better promised land of Christ and eternity. Meaning, even if we die, he, he has led us in. 
It's part of his plan. It's part of his purpose. Why would he lead us out spiritually? Why would Jesus come and die on the cross for us and allow disease to ravish us if he had no divine purpose for it? So even in the worst case scenario, not saying this with insensitivity, but looking at the bigger picture that God is completely sovereign over every moment of our lives. Why would he save us and just leave us? He led us out of sin so that he can lead us into the promised land of Christ and eternity. Now in verse 27, Jesus adds a gentle rebuke. His question is rhetorical in nature. Look at verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And you know the answer to that is none of us. Right? None of us have, have successfully turned back time. In fact, a lot of times, my greatest anxiety is I just don't have enough time to get things done. And I, I assume that that creates stress for a lot of you as well. Right? We just don't have enough time. But by being anxious about it, it's, 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 there's no plan, there's no execution of adding a single hour. Instead, we just need to learn how to use our time, how to reprioritize, how to let certain things go, right? And so which of you, by worrying or being anxious, can add a single hour to span of, span of, of life? And the answer is no one. Then in verses 28 to 30, Jesus uses the, uses the illustration of flowers for the basic necessity of clothing, now, I once had a brother who looked at this passage and said, this is why I do not buy flowers for my wife. And I said, that's not Jesus' point here. Okay, Jesus' point is, 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 I know flowers are fleeting, they die, but you ought to still woo to the best of your ability. And for some of us, I think flowers are just a minimum, right? We're still learning how to go beyond just flowers on special occasions but if you notice in verses 27 uh, to 28, Jesus says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. My Hanley International Version, my HIV says, Consider the tulips, the most beautiful flower. Right? Consider, and I know HIV is a disease. I understand that. Okay. Consider the lilies or the tulips of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, with his bank account and the most glorious clothing he could purchase, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field with flowers, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, he will Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? There comes the rebuke, right? If he lavishes the grass fields with beautiful flowers to give it color, will he not provide basic necessities, including warmth for his people? Now, the apologetic question, the theological objection would be, well, then why does God allow poverty? I think this text doesn't answer it. But that's where we realize, okay, it goes back now to human sin. It goes back down to what has happened. Right? It goes back down to what is the responsibility of, 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 of Christians and Christ followers to uphold justice and to provide and to be generous. And so, so we look at how God cares. But, but when I think of American Christianity, I think that if people wanted to, it's, they can get clothing. There are charities. There are places. See, our problem is not so much whether we can get basic clothing, but it's we don't want to wear Kirkland and we want Versace or we want options, right? And so a lot of times we have to think, what is the definition of poor? What is the definition of poor? Is it no clothing versus it is, is it a type of clothing that is considered a lower quality Right? So you see here another argument from lesser to greater. Right? And in verse 30, I want to explain this. When it, says, when it says these flowers are thrown into the oven, this is not baking flour. Okay? This, this word flour is the same type of flour. It's like a tulip or a lily. Okay? What, what's going on here? Who, how many of you throw flowers into your oven? Anybody? Well, well here's what's happening. In, in ancient Israel... They would use a furnace or an oven to cook, and you would put, you would, you would, you would have fuel burning underneath and inside the pots or inside the oven. 
okay? And, and what they would often do is you'd have a fire beneath, but what happens inside is that they would burn dried grass or dried flowers, and they would use that as fuel. So the point he's trying to make is that is the flowers, they're so beautiful, yet they fade, and, and they're thrown into the oven, and they're used as just fuel. They're burned, meaning the value of a flower is is fleeting. The value of flowers is not high, yet God still provides these flowers for the, for the grass, to clothe the grass. Will he not care for you? Are you not so much more precious than a flower that's just used in an oven and burned, O oh, you of little faith? Here's the thing. Most of us are not anxious about food. You know what makes us worried? Oh, man, I'm so busy. Traffic's so bad. I don't have time to go to the grocery store, or I don't want to. You see, we have options. We have well, what I call problems of the privileged, right? Or you've heard that phrase before. We have first world problems. Oh, man, I got to go to the grocery store. Oh, man, my fridge is empty again. Well, you have a fridge. Oh, man, I got to go to Costco, and it's crazy right now. It's apocalyptic. I don't want to go to Costco. Well, you have a Costco membership. That's a privilege. Oh, man, I got to cook. See, see, most of us, we're not saying I don't have food. We're, when we say there is no food, it means we need to go to the store and we need to cook. First world problems. When we say I don't have clothing, I, I need to do the laundry. That's what we mean. Or when we look at clothing, you know what our problems are, what we're worried about? Yeah, honestly, when I was picking my shirt this morning, I said, did I wear this last week? I have options. I have options. Oh, I don't have anything to wear. What do I mean by that? Oh, my favorite piece of clothing is in the laundry basket and needs to be washed. That's what we mean. Right now, Jesus doesn't promise that we'll all have, like I said, Versace. But Kirkland will do just fine. Right? Haynes will do just fine. And so the Lord provides for us. But what happens is that because most of us in this room don't worry about basic food and we don't worry about basic clothing, we begin to def redefine the meaning of provision. And we say, God, I want you to provide for me better housing, a better vehicle health. Lord, I want you to provide for me other things, a job, sinless children, a spouse, marriage, a relationship. Those are all good things. And when we receive these people and these things, no doubt these are gifts from God. But they're far from necessities that we need in life. And so what happens is that those who actually are poor and who actually are looking for food and clothing, they don't worry about the greater things. They don't worry about the stock market. They don't worry about their 401k. They, these things don't make them anxious because they're so focused on where am I going to get my next meal. You see, it puts things into perspective that the more we have, the more we worry. And I'm not saying that we should all be destitutes, but we have to put things into perspective and remember that even if we get sick, we're still very blessed. We're still very blessed, right? And Jesus is our ultimate true and better provider. You see, we must not confuse, as one preacher said, we, we must not confuse the resource with the source. We focus too much on the provision, we forget about our provider. Ultimately, we are not the provider. Your job and, and every skill and talent that you have is a resource. The person who gives that job and the abilities to you, he's the source. Everything that you own, everything that you have, including your health, because you're able to maintain health, because you have clothing and shelter and medicine and food, right? Those are resources. The source is Jesus. We are not the source. Therefore, we don't have to worry we're not in control. We are not the source. God is the source. Everything else is a resource. These things that God has given us, including our health, is a provision. He is the provider. God is the source. He is the sovereign source. 
He is the sovereign sustainer. He is the divine superglue that holds all things in the universe together. And he definitely cares about his bride. And he definitely cares about those that he died for. And we who he's purchased with his blood. And he will get us home one way or the other. In essence, when we forget about our divine purpose and our divine provider, we lose sight of our distinctive priority. And this leads us to point number three, our distinctive priority. The, the last two points will be much shorter because the, the text is shorter in these portions. Our distinctive priority. Notice verses 31 and 33. Now, I chose the word distinctive rather than distinct. Because the English word distinct just means distinguishable. Meaning, let's just say you have a line of very nice vehicles. And there happens to be one that's hot pink. Well, that particular car is distinct. It stands out. It just stands out. But distinctive means a distinct quality. And when you're talking about human beings and our purpose for life, we're talking about our quality of character, our quality of being, our quality of lifestyle, who we are, our personhood, then, then I love the word distinctive. We are to have a distinctive priority in life, a distinctive quality about us as Christ followers that sets us apart from this world, especially in a time of crisis. Our greatest distinctive priority is that we have Christ and we have our King and we have the Word of God giving us guidance and wisdom. I want you to first notice verse 32. Verse 32, it says we are to be different from those who don't worship God. Then in verse 33, what makes us different is that that distinctive quality that makes us different is that we, pr we are to prioritize and seek first His kingship and His righteous character. Now look with me now where it says this. Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? The answer is simple. Drink coffee. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't say that. This is verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows what you, that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Now, first, this word Gentiles here, we're, most of us are Gentiles here. There may be someone in here who's Jewish, but most of us are Gentiles by, by ethnicity and by blood. A Gentile in this context is used differently. In Jesus' time, where the church is not yet established, he hasn't gone to the cross yet, this word Gentiles is used to describe anyone who doesn't have a relationship with God. How fitting for this idea of panic and, and, and this world where we're driven by fear. You look at how the non-Christian lives and it makes sense. If they don't have a relationship with God, then they have to worry, right? They have to worry. So naturally, they're on their own. The atheist, the agnostic, they don't know if God exists. So they don't know that God will provide for them or cares for them. So they live that way. The atheist does not believe in God. So of course, they're worried. The deist, not the theist, but the deist. Deism believes that God he exists, but he's just transcendent. He doesn't care about his creation. That's not the Christ follower. The Christ follower believes that God cares. Case in point is that the man teaching them. Jesus is standing there. God cared enough to send himself. The Son of God comes down in human flesh because he cares to save human beings and to communicate them and to reveal himself to them. Right? So God cares. You see, when you think about the concept of the fear of God, when you look at worry, when you look at anxiety, beneath worry and anxiety, there's a root issue, and the root problem is fear. But the reason why we fear, it's not a bad thing, the reason why we fear is that we were created to fear God in a healthy and reverent way. I want you to think of Moses when he's standing there and there's a bush on fire, he's terrified. He's terrified, but the bush is not turning into ashes. And when God meets him, when he meets God up on Mount Sinai, he's terrified because he's in the presence of God. But God is relating to him. When Isaiah stood before the presence of the Lord, there's a reverent fear. When John 
is given in the book of Revelation. He's brought before Christ and he sees Christ in glory. He's trembling in fear. You see, when you are so afraid of God in a healthy way and you know that that God goes with you, you're actually not afraid of anything else in this world. You can go face your enemies. Moses was not proud. His confidence was in the fact that he had a first hand front row seat to this relationship with God. And so if you fear God, you're naturally not going to be as afraid of anything else in this world. But if you don't fear God, of course, you've never experienced God. You've never come before the holy presence of God. So everything else in the world, you must be afraid of. So we shouldn't criticize the non-Christian for panic buying. Because they don't have God. But for the believer, you understand that you can get as much Perel as you want. And you can cover yourself. But if God has planned for you somehow, even with the preventative measures, to get sick, then how will you respond? Is that not part of his good plan for us? Right? You could wrap yourself in toilet paper, you'll be a mummy. So, so, so as Christians, the question is not how should the world respond. I think the question is as Christ followers, how do we live? And that's what Jesus means. The Gentiles who don't know God, that they worry. They seek after these things. They don't have a God who will provide for them. One scholar said, anxiety is a barometer of one's God. Meaning what you worry about reveals who you worship or whether you worship at all. You see, that's the point Jesus is making, and there he comes, the gentle rebuke. You of little faith. He's talking to the believers now. If you're a believer, we must strengthen our faith. You see, then he says, okay, how do we combat anxiety and fear? He says, verse 33, believers are to seek first his kingdom. Now this word seek first, it's not used chronologically, but the original language, it's speaking of singularity. Seek first means to center your entire life on Christ, to prioritize your undivided devotion to Christ. The kingdom of God refers to the kingship of Christ. You see, when it comes to God's kingdom, the reason why this is not one place is because God's kingdom is, is not is not one specific geographical location. But when you speak of his kingdom, you're talking about God's dominion and his rule. And so his kingship is what Matthew and Jesus have in mind. Seek first to surrender to the kingship of Christ, that he is Lord over your life and he's sovereign over your life and is manifested in Christ. And his righteousness refers to the same righteous character laid out in the Beatitudes, meaning The way that we receive the righteousness that brings us into his kingdom is Christ. No good works will win you that righteousness, that righteous character. But if you are clothed with Christ, you are a member of his kingdom, living under his kingship and his dominion and reign. And so if you seek first Christ and seek first to surrender to his kingship and still be responsible as a Christ follower then all these things will be added to you. That's a promise. All these things will be added unto you refers to everything you need to live for Christ. Basic necessities, but everything that you need to live for him until he takes you home and it's different for each of us. Everything that you need, he will provide for you if you live for him. And so when you think very logically and in a commonsensical, I know that's not a word, but a commonsensical manner, If you truly live for Christ, you will be responsible. You will love your neighbor. You will wash your hands, right? You will pray for the sick. You will take preventative measures. You will go to work. You will provide, right? You won't be lazy. You seek first his kingship and what it means to live life for him. And your life won't be like that car alarm, right? Where you'll be alarmed by everything. So let me just make things very simple for you. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness means center your life on Christ and he will provide what you need. And that leads to point number four. Point number four is perspective, our daily perspective. You see, when we worry and when our worry turns into anxiety, 
We forget our purpose, we forget our provider, we forget our priority, and we lose our perspective. So point number four is daily perspective, verse 34, one verse. God is completely sovereign over our future. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know God holds yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if you'll look with me at verse 34, Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day it's, is its own trouble. Now, here's the sobering reality. And this is why we don't worship a pie in the sky God. I want you to look very carefully at that final clause. Notice it says, Jesus is basically saying, you're going to have enough trouble today. You see that? I love it how Jesus does not sugarcoat anything. He's saying, life is hard. You're going to have problems. So let's trust him to get us through today. You know, what, he, what he's talking about is his daily grace. He's saying that Jesus will give us the grace we need for today. So tomorrow you'll come back to him and say, provide us our daily bread, and you'll ask him again, protect us from the evil one. Provide for us. Protect us. And you'll come to him each day asking for his grace to get you through troubles of the day. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So you don't it doesn't help to worry about tomorrow. Now, this doesn't mean don't plan, but it just means we need to worry reasonably. Notice Jesus does not say that life will be easy or worry-free. Instead, he's saying we, we need to worry to a certain degree, but it cannot hinder us from worship. Problems will blind us from appreciating today's provision. If we worry too much and begin to worship the problems of today, or the problems of tomorrow, it will blind us from appreciating what he's provided for us today. So the big idea of today's message is surrender your anxieties to Christ because he is our ultimate purpose, provider, priority, and perspective. The man teaching this principle and this lesson is the sovereign Lord. We are to surrender our anxieties to him, Christ, because he is our ultimate purpose, provider, priority, and perspective. Beloved, if you give me an extra five minutes of grace, I'll give you some application. I wanted to get very specific and say, how does this passage apply more specifically to fear of disease and crisis? So how do we respond to COVID-19? And I will even talk about how should we respond if you get it, if you get COVID-19 as Christians. First, because God is sovereign and he is the sustainer of all of life, we must have one, faith in Christ, not fear in crisis. You understand that? We must have faith in Christ, not fear in crisis. The reason why I don't believe that we should right now cancel services is because more than anything, the church of God needs to see the man of God and men of God and women of God standing firm proclaiming the word of God and pointing people to Christ. Faith in Christ, not fear in crisis. Secondly, we need hearts filled with worship and not worry. Third, we need Christ-like sensitivity and practical wisdom and prayerful love. But if you don't have faith in Christ and if you don't worship Christ, you will not love your neighbor. You will be paranoid and you will hate your neighbor. You will worry about anyone. Could you imagine if I were to ask you the question, Somebody's sick in the hospital. I, as the pastor, should I go? Maybe there's a few of you and said, don't go to the hospital. That's the most dangerous place you can go to right now. But most of you would say, no, 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 we shouldn't go, but you should go. Why should I go? Because you're the pastor. As if I have force field around me? No, no, no. The reason why I should go is because I have to be an example of faith to you. And the reason you ought to go as well, if you need to, is because we have the same faith and we have the same Christ. Right? And so if we have faith in Christ, not fear in crisis, and if our hearts are filled with worship and not worry, then we will have Christ-like sensitivity. We will exercise practical wisdom, but we will have prayerful love. That's that slide. Okay? So what happens, what happens if you get infected, right? If you get infected uh, with COVID-19, Okay? The first thing we need to do is the application is trust that
that every trial is part of God's sovereign plan for your life. So you should take every precaution, wash your hands a lot, pray, be careful, okay? But the first thing we have to do is trust. If you get it, then the first thing you gotta do is say, okay, God, this is not a good thing, but I've taken preventative measures. I'm not gonna blame people. I'm not gonna get mad or racist, you know, but I've been responsible. I haven't traveled anywhere I shouldn't have traveled. I've done what I can. Okay, Lord, this is part of your sovereign design for my life. How do I treat this trial like any other trial, like if I got cancer? Or like I was minding my own business on the freeway and a drunk driver hit me. How would I respond? Does God still exist? Does he still love me? Does he? Yes. So how would you respond? Second, we must worship Christ as a witness of our confidence in the gospel. You see, seek first the kingdom, center our lives on Christ. The unbeliever watches you. Your family members watch you. The people in the hospital watch you. They see the difference between someone who in this passage lives like a Christ follower versus a Gentile or someone who doesn't know God. We must worship Christ as a witness of your confidence. And thirdly, we must love our neighbor as ourselves. We must love our neighbor. So how do you love your neighbor? You get medical treatment. You quarantine yourself to protect others from getting sick. You take preventative measures. You see how we're, we're no longer putting the cart before the horse? So like I said, should we wash our hands? Yes. Should we be careful? Yes. But you see what's happening with a lot of Christians? Is that they're prioritizing those things and putting faith second. Putting prayer last. But you see, when you put things into order of I trust that God is completely sovereign over my life and he sustains every moment, I'm still going to worship Christ. Then the third one comes into order without panic, without worry, without racism. Then we say, how do I love my neighbor? Okay, I should wash my hands. We should clean surfaces. We should be careful. We should, we should consider those who are more prone and susceptible to disease. That's loving our neighbor. But you can't love your neighbor rightly if you don't love God because you love yourself too much. But again, I'm preaching to the choir because you're here today. Okay, you're here today. So once again, we're going to end with a big idea. Big idea one more time. Surrender your anxieties to Christ because he is our ultimate purpose, provider, Priority and perspective. He purifies us. He covers you with his blood, which is stronger than anything else in this world. Let's pray. Father, you saved us. Paul tells us that you did not spare your own son, but you gave him up for us. How will you not also with, with Christ graciously give us all things we need for the Christian life? Father, I pray that our confidence this morning would not be in Perel, but in the pure blood of Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would not have to cover ourselves, Lord, but that we would be covered by the blood of Christ. Father, we pray, Lord, that our confidence would be in you. And help us, Lord, to shine as light in a world of fear and darkness. Help us, Lord, to enter into the daily unknown, knowing, Lord, that we're going to be okay because we are known by you. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you would protect then everybody in this room from disease, not just COVID-19, but the flu, from cancer, and from sin. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would provide everything that we need so that we can be the strongest representation of you, the King, because you are sovereign this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.